In this video, I'm going to talk about detailed balance. So before we dive into detailed balance, I wanted to motivate the problem a little bit. Suppose we had an atom that occasionally experiences some sort of event, like let's say a collision with another electron here, that causes it to undergo a transition to an excited state. So we let's say we just have two states, one with energy E0 and the excited state energy E1. Now let's get a whole bunch of these atoms together here and start talking about what kind of population of these atoms we have in state E0 versus state E1. Now one could imagine that they all start here in E0 and occasionally one of these events happens and one of them pops up into E1. Now if there were no reverse process then eventually if we let this play out long enough all of these atoms would end up in the excited state and nobody would be in the ground state because there's no reverse process. There's no way for them to get back down. So let's suppose there's also a collisional de-excitation, like maybe this electron uh, when hitting an atom in the excited state can actually pull off a little bit of the energy that goes into the kinetic energy of the electron and we now have a path for getting some of these guys back down into the ground state. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the probabilities of going there. So maybe P01 is the probability of transitioning in a collision from the ground state to the excited state, and P10 is the reverse. Uh, it's the probability, if you're in the excited state, of transitioning through a collision into the ground state. So now let's start our experiment over again. We put all of our atoms into the ground state and start playing forward. Well, in the beginning, there are no atoms in the excited state, so there are no de-excitations happening. Uh, but there are lots of atoms in the ground state, so when collisions happen, there's preferentially one direction they're going to go. They're all going to start transitioning up to here. But as soon as we start getting more of these atoms in the excited state, then some of those are going to start transitioning back down into the ground state through these de-excitations. And this process is going to uh, converge eventually to where the rate of excitation, the rate going from 0 to 1, needs to match the rate going from 1 to 0. And that's, uh, in that case, we've achieved an equilibrium. So in thermal equilibrium, R10 is going to equal R01. And what are R10 and R01? Well, they have to do with the probability of those transitions happening and the population in each state. So the rate of transitions from 0 to 1 will be the number of atoms that are in the, the 0 state times the probability of going from zero, state 0 to state 1, uh, where that probability has something to do with the inherent probability of that transition and the rate of these, uh, these collisions. So the probability times C, which we'll call the collision rate. But in similarly, the rate of de-excitation is going to be the number of atoms in the excited state times the probability of transitioning down, de-exciting, de in a collision times the rate of collisions. Now it turns out to achieve thermal equilibrium, we don't necessarily have to say that the probability of transitioning up matches the probability of transitioning down. Because even if these probabilities are unequal, let's say it's uh, a lot harder to transition up than it is to transition down, then all that means is that you know, we can put a lot of it into the ground state and occasionally it transitions up, but then it very rapidly transitions down again. So you end up with a big pileup of atoms in the ground state and a few atoms in the excited state. But because there are a whole bunch of atoms in the ground state multiplied by a small probability, you can match that to a few atoms in the excited state times a much higher probability of de-excitation. And so you can get these rates to match just by changing the ratio of the number of atoms in the excited and de-excited state. So in the two-state system here, this is a, a rather straightforward thing to solve for. Uh, you can match your rates, you can figure out what your transition probabilities are, and then you can solve for the ratio of atoms in the excited and unexcited states.
But things get much more complicated when you start adding in more states here. So let's do a different case now where we have three states. So why do things get more complicated here? Well, there are a lot of different processes for getting from one place to another. For example, atoms in the ground state can transition up to the first excited state, or they might transition up to the, the highest state here. And similarly, if you're in the highest state, you could transition down to the middle state or all the way down to the ground state. And from the, the middle position here, you could also transition up or transition down. So now when you want to talk about how you get from, say, the zeroth state here to the first state up here, there are multiple pathways. One way is to just transition directly up into that state, but you could also transition into a higher state here, the higher energy state, and then de-excite down into that energy state. So there are multiple pathways to getting, for getting to the same place. So you can imagine in this case that the rate of going from 0 to 1 is equal to the number of atoms in the ground state times the probability of going into the first energy state plus the number of atoms in the ground state who transition up to the highest energy state and then of those the number who transition from the higher energy state down into the middle energy state. And all of this is of course dependent upon the number of collisions. And this doesn't even account for some perhaps more esoteric ways of, of going through this, like perhaps transitioning up to the excited state, the highest excited state, back down again, and then up into the middle state. And this is just a three energy state system. Now, so if you have a whole bunch of different energy states, you could end up with a whole bunch of different pathways for getting from one energy level to another energy level. And this becomes something that's very difficult to solve for. You have to write a whole bunch of equations out to solve for the number of, of atoms in each energy state. So this is where the idea of detailed balance comes in. The idea of detailed balance is that for some systems, and I'll elaborate in a second about what the caveats here, but for some systems, you don't need to worry about all the multiple different pathways you can have to get from one energy state to another. The idea of detailed balance is that in equilibrium, each basic process, each event, will be balanced by its exact reverse. Each process, we'll call it. Each process is balanced by its inverse. This means that you know, if we're looking at transitions that go from 0 to 1, just that simple transition here, then the simple transition from 1 to 0 will balance that out. And similarly, if we want to look at excitations from energy level 0 up to 2, that will exactly be balanced by the exact inverse process of going from 2 to 0. So we don't need to consider all these different pathways for getting into 1. We don't need to balance the excitation rate of 0 to 1 and 0 to 2 to 1 against anything else. We balance each fundamental process, and that's the detail and detailed balance, each fundamental process we can balance against its own inverse and not any of the other different pathways for achieving that. And this simplifies our life dramatically because if we can make the assumption of detailed balance, then we can set N0, P0, 1 times the collision rate. We can set that equal to N1, P1, 0 times the collision rate. And so we find that we can solve for the relative populations in each state simply on the basis of ratios of probabilities for going in and out of these various states. And that this was not affected by whatever was going on with energy level 2. All right, but I warned you that there were going to be some caveats. So I'm going to draw a system here where this doesn't work out. So suppose I have three states, which I'm going to draw over here. State 0, state 1, and state 2. We transition from 0 to 1. We can transition from 1 to 2 and transition from 2 to 0. And we could go in the other direction as well, from 1 to 0, 0 could go to 2, and 2 could go to 1. Now, suppose I, I assign some kind of strange probabilities here. Let's say there is a 80% probability going from 0 to 1, 80% from going 1 to 2, and just to make it easy, same for 
going from 2 to 0. But let's suppose the reverse process in this case only has a 10% in each case, 10% probability. So here's where things get a little weird. So suppose we start out our atoms in state 0 here, and some of them get excited into the first energy state, and only a very few of them go backwards here. Now, detailed balance would have us believe that once this thing comes into equilibrium, that the rate of transition from 0 to 1 is going to match the rate of transition from 1 to 0. And for that to work, we'd have to have a whole bunch of these guys pile up here, such that the number in state 1 times the 10% probability of de-excitation matches the fewer in state 0 with the much higher probability of transitioning up. But here's where we get into trouble. If we pile up a whole bunch of atoms in this excited state, they have an alternate path to get back down to zero. They could go to first to two and then to zero. And the product of those probabilities is going to be 64%, which is much higher than the 10% here. So if we piled up all of these atoms here in state one, what would they really do? Well, they would, they would start transitioning over into two, and then they'd come back into state zero. And you can kind of see just by the symmetry of the problem that just by the symmetry, we're going to end up with the same number of atoms in each state as they circulate around here. But that clearly does not satisfy detailed balance. So what went wrong here? Detailed balance only works if the probabilities around the closed loop match for the two directions you can go around that loop. And this is called the Kolmogorov criterion. So in a way, this is kind of a, a conservation law. If we have energy systems where the probability of going between various energy states is strictly proportional to energy such that you could figure out what the probability of going from 0 to 2 and back down is simply by the intermediate process of going from 0 to 1 and then 1 to 2 and then 2 to 1 and then 1 to 0. In this kind of conserved system, detailed balance works out. But in a system like this where these closed loops definitely do not match one way around versus the other, detailed balance can't work out. There are other pathways which end up dominating the flow of atoms. Fortunately, a lot of natural systems satisfy the Kolmogorov criterion, and so detailed balance is a principle is a principle we can rely on in a lot of equilibrium states in nature, which is why we talk about it here. But occasionally you do come up with situations where detailed balance is not satisfied because the Kolmogorov criterion is not satisfied even though it's in equilibrium. And you have to be careful about those situations.